All right. Well, welcome everyone to our kickoff webinar for Phenology Week. Today, we're going to be looking back at 15 years of Nature's Notebook history and um, also acknowledging all of the efforts of you all, um, those of you that are on the call today and other Nature's Notebook observers and partners that couldn't be here today. Uh, my name is Erin Postumus. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the USA National Phenology Network, located here in Tucson at the University of Arizona. And um, we're going to be going through and introducing the rest of our staff that are here today as well. Um, but first off, I just wanted to start out with kind of the reason why we are doing Phenology Week this week. Um, we are primarily trying to celebrate you all. So we're um, very appreciative of all of the efforts that you do every day, every week when you submit your phenology observations through Nature's Notebook, um, all of the work that our local phenology leaders do to engage observers, um, and all the, the work of our partners and the, the collaboration opportunities that we have. So um, we wanted to take a, a whole week to kind of celebrate um, Nature's Notebook and Nature's Notebook observers. Um, and we also wanted to do it to coincide with the spring equinox, which is today. So happy spring to everyone on the call here. Um, and I invite you to, if you'd like to put, you should be able to um, put in the chat and maybe Samantha, if um, chat is not enabled, maybe you can make sure that that's possible. Uh, if you'd like to just share with us where you're you're joining us from and anything that you'd like to mention about maybe signs of spring that you're seeing where you live, or even if you're not seeing signs of spring, what it looks like uh, where you are located today. All right, so I wanted to just give an overview of our staff here. So we're going to go around and do some introductions. Um, some of you might not have met all of our staff yet, but it's a great opportunity to kind of see everyone's face and get a little bit of um, background on everyone. Um, and unfortunately, our director, Teresa Crimmins, couldn't be here today. Um, she's on a very well-deserved vacation this week. So um, we're sorry to miss her, but we are fortunate to have the rest of our core team here today. Um, so I think I'll, I'll kick it off by passing it to Ellen first, and then we can each just kind of share, you know, your role here at the National Phenology Network, some background that you want to share, and then anything you want to say about, you know, things that you like to observe in Nature's Notebook or anything like that. Hi, everybody. I am Ellen Denny. I am the monitoring design and data coordinator for the team. Um, I am a forest ecologist by training, and I have lived in New England for most of my adult life. I've been in Maine for the last 20 years, and I've been working remotely for the um, network for the, uh, the NPN for about 15 years now, since the beginning. Um, and I am responsible for um, co coordinating the development of the monitoring protocols and kind of looking after data quality of our uh, uh, observation data. And right now in Maine, um, it's probably my favorite. Actually, I don't pick favorites. Um, one of my favorite signs of spring is the crocuses coming out. And um, that's about all that I have right now. The rest of the things haven't started to pop, but that's what we got here. All right, thanks. Maybe we can just go through an order that we have on the slide here. So Jeff, you wanna go next? Sure. Hello, everybody. It's uh, nice to meet you all. I'm uh, the systems analyst. So I do a lot of the computer programming and IT activities here at the MPN. Uh, I'm originally from Wyoming, but I do now live in Tucson. I've worked with the MPN for about seven years now, I think. Um, it's a great team to work with. And um, I think in terms of favorite signs of spring or uh, phenological observations, usually I really do enjoy the, uh, the orange blossoms here when they come out, but this year, I'm particularly particularly excited because we have some uh, ocotillos in our front yard that have been babies, so they haven't flowered. But this is the first uh, season. I was just looking out there this morning, and they're um, getting ready to bloom. So pretty excited about that. And uh, we'll pass it over to Nathan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nathan Acosta. I'm the web developer for the MPN. Uh, I've been here with the team, I think it's close to two years now. Um, yeah, I've been liking it so far. I'm in charge of um, keeping the website running, 
also working with Jeff in other computer programming projects and hopefully um, launching the new website pretty soon. Um, and yeah, I'm originally from Mexico, pretty close to the US actually in Sonora. Um, and yeah, I've always liked the, um, I guess, desert fauna. Um, it's pretty crazy just to see like, it, sometimes you think it's pretty, I don't know, barren land, but you start seeing life in, I don't know, the insects coming out and just like the mesquites also flowering or like just blooming. Um, that's always nice. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited to be here and having all of you join us. I'll pass it to Alisa. Thanks. Yeah, it's wonderful to have a, a community moment to celebrate. Um, yeah, I'm Melissa Rose Martin. I'm the Partnership and Application Specialist. I've also been here a long time, 14 years this month, I think. Um, and I am originally from outside of Philadelphia, um, lived in Arizona for 10 years, and then moved back to the East Coast in 2015. Um, so I live near north of Austin now. Um, and I do a lot of work with um, agency partners like the Park Service, the Forest Service, Indigenous communities, some data product development stuff. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm grateful to the NPN community. Over to Sam. Hello, my name is Samantha Brewer and I'm the Volunteer Engagement Coordinator for the USA National Phenology Network. I've been here on the team for just barely over a year now and I had gotten started because um, I took the training to um, develop a local phenology program for my organization and um, ran it for about two years and then joined here. And now I just love being able to help um, other folks like yourself um, develop your own local phenology programs and get excited about phenology. And I just love working with all of our volunteers and leaders across the country. And I'm very grateful to be here and very grateful for all of you and all of your participation. Awesome, thanks. Um, and just to share a little bit about my background, um, I started out here at the National Phenology Network back in 2010. Um, I was a a graduate student at the U of A at the time. And actually I talked to Alyssa about doing an internship here at the NPN um, as an outreach assistant. And then that turned into a job and I've been here ever since. Um, and I would say right now, I'm really excited about tracking the milkweeds that we have in our yard. I've been doing that as part of one of our campaigns called Desert Refuge. And we have a couple Arizona milkweeds that are just covered in flower buds. So I'm excited for them to start blooming. Um, and also hoping that I might see a Lucy's warbler, which is part of another project we're starting called Project Lucy Tree. We have a couple little Lucy nest boxes that are just waiting to be inhabited. So keeping an eye on those as well. Um, all right, let me see. Do I don't know if we have any of our students here. Does anyone, can anyone look through the list and see? Maybe not. Um, so we can virtually introduce our, our many students that we have with us this year. Um, Ariana Ortega just started with us um, in January, and she's doing a lot of amazing social media communications, um, helping to reboot our Instagram account, um, working with Samantha on that. Um, we also have Mino Tianatongo, who is doing administrative work, helping with all the, the stuff we have to do to process things like travel and purchases and things like that. We have um, Sofia Guadalupe Delgado. She's one of our interns working on a, a project for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partnership, um, making some info sheets to help communicate the changes in phenology that are happening in Fish and Wildlife Service regions. We also have Viviana Beltran. She is a volunteer engagement assistant and doing a lot of work to help put our materials into Spanish and, and talking with different communities about um, different kinds of lesson plans we can make to engage with Spanish-speaking audiences. Um, and then we have Ava Lassiter, who's been with us for two years now, and she's with another internship program um, working on a, a research project looking at um, southwestern phenology of some local plants here. So we love working with all of our students. We're fortunate to have quite a few this year, um, and we're always excited to see them do their work and, and learn different things about phenology. We also um, wanted to mention that we have um, several different collaborators that we contract with. Um, so we have two different projects, so we're fortunate to have some collaborators 
right now. One is our Time to Restore project. This is a, a project funded by the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, we have Gail Bishop, who's located in Mississippi, who is um, working with us both on the Gulf Coast Phenology Trail, as well as the Time to Restore project. Um, Jane Breckenridge with the Tribal Alliance for Pollinators, who's based out of Oklahoma, uh, and Gina Lloyd, who's based out of Louisiana, working as our, our Louisiana coordinator for Time to Restore. And then on our, uh, we have a, a new-ish forest service partnership that we're working on, um, and there is a, an effort to focus on kind of the northeast region, um, looking at shifting seasons on national forest lands, and we have a few different collaborators there, um, Rachel Goland, Georgia Murray, and Haley as well, who are working on that project. So um, really fortunate to be collaborating with these great individuals as well. And of course, don't wanna leave out that our network is comprised of, of all of you, um, all of our Nature's Notebook participants, as well as all the other local phenology programs, um, especially our local phenology leaders who really make things happen on the ground. Um, and this is just a, an updated map from this month that shows um, all of the different Nature's Notebook observation locations across the country. Um, so it's really impressive when you see, you know, just how many people have contributed to Nature's Notebook and we really value all of you. So thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna kind of get into some of the history of, of Nature's Notebook and NPN, but before we start, we just wanna acknowledge that phenology is certainly not a new science and indigenous peoples have been practicing phenology, phenology since time immemorial. Um, so just wanted to recognize that, you know, people have been thinking about phenology, understanding and paying attention to seasonal cycles and, and using that information to make decisions and um, make sure that they're able to, you know, have food and um, take management actions that will really make a difference and, and enable them to survive. So we um, just want to acknowledge that um, that has been going on for a very long time and we appreciate the foundation of phenology that Indigenous peoples have, have given us. So we, we have a few milestones in our Nature Sofa history and I definitely welcome the rest of our staff to chime in here if you want to add any details or any other information that I missed. I, I know there's a lot of um, institutional knowledge in this group, so there's definitely a lot to say, I think, about all of these things. But to start out, um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, our roots really do come from lilacs. And you might be aware we, we have a campaign that focuses on lilacs, but this project actually goes way back to the 1950s. And um, there was research at the time where there, there was a professor who wanted to distribute cloned plants. And he was thinking that, you know, by sending out genetically cloned individual plants for distribution across the country, um, that would take out that genetic piece of the equation and allow people to really report what was happening with leafing and flowering of a plant that was genetically identical. And we could really see the impact of the environment for those plants. So if there was a, a cold spring or a cold winter, you might see that reflected in what happened to the plant in that year. And so um, there are a number of people that started out reporting their sightings of when their lilacs would leaf out and bloom. And that data set has continued to today. Um, and that's really kind of the foundation of having this um, nationwide observation program. Um, and also I wanted to point out um, one of our co-founders, Mark Schwartz, his mother, um, Marjorie Helen Schwartz, who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, um, she was one of those early lilac observers. So we are appreciative to all of those early lilac observers that kind of gave us that, that foundation. But what the lilac observations turned into was this national observation program that now includes over 1,750 different species of plants and animals. So this is what one of our typical protocols looks like. You're probably familiar with this if you're a Nature's Notebook observer. Um, and so uh, you can see that it's really become a much more rigorous program. We have you know, questions about what you see. We have our phenophase definitions. Um, and Ellen in particular, I wanted to call you out because you are really the architect of these protocols. And I don't know if you want to say anything about kind of the, the development of those um, early on and then more recently, but you've put a lot of work into that. Um, yeah, um, it started out, um, with something that Mark Schwartz had developed for his team and or for his group in Wisconsin that was based on, it was somewhat similar to the original lilac protocols and it worked great in, uh, the Northern tier of the United States where we have temperate, um, a temperate climate and 
you know, spring predictably came out and stuff flowered and then it stopped flowering and it fruited and then it started over again the next year. And um, we had something like that. The original protocols were um, very North, North centric in the first year. And we started hearing people from people in Arizona um, specifically about the creosote bush that didn't follow that pattern. And so it would flower and fruit and then flower again and flower again. And it, you know, depended a lot on the precipitation in an arid, um, in an arid climate. And so we ended up needing to change the protocols rather than saying, yes, I see first leaf and then leave it at that for until the next year, or I see first flower and not have to return to that until the next year. We move to what we call status monitoring, where observers go out and are given a question, do you see open flowers um, and on any day of the year? And they can say yes and no, yes or no. So then that allows it, allowed us to capture more broadly phenology in um, different systems, different climates. Um, and so maybe I'll leave it at that for now, but. <laughs> Sounds good, thank you. Um, and then just wanted to mention some kind of early hiccups along the way. So. Um, the screen cap on the left is our very first website. I'm pretty sure I had to go back to the Wayback Machine to get a screen cap of this one, but very basic. You can see not super user friendly, kind of the, the websites of old. So uh, we've, we've definitely come a long way and we're really excited that we have a new website coming out soon. Um, and then also wanted to share and other people can um, share maybe more details about this story. But um, early on, our original executive director, Jake Weltzien, went on Science Friday to help promote Nature's Notebook. And unfortunately, just at that time, the website broke. And so we had a bunch of people trying to come to the website and it, it didn't <laughs> work out. So uh, we've learned since then to make sure that the website will be working when we have big promotional events. But that was a, kind of an early <laughs> indicator of some bad things happening. <laughs> yeah, I was sitting there working on, um, we were, I think we were, just starting this, the very first iteration of what became Nature's Notebook, was, it's not shown here, but it was very not user-friendly in that you could enter stuff, but it, you had no validation. You, you had no idea whether it went in or you couldn't see what you put in to quality control it. Um, and so we were working on the final touches of the, the newer website that was going to you know, solve all those problems. And Jake was on Science Friday and I was sitting there working on, you know, getting this thing ready. And it, and it was, everything was fine until he mentions, they asked, is there a website people can go to? And he says, yes, you go to www.usanpn.org. And then suddenly things got slower and slower and slower. And then I got that message that um, it wasn't exactly this, I forget what it said, but it was just basically like a blank screen. And we just, you know, hadn't anticipated the, the number of people hitting all at once. Yeah, so we've, we've certainly smoothed out kinks since then. And while we do sometimes still have issues with overload of our database, because there's just, there's so much data now and there's so many people interested. Uh, we have learned a lot since then and, and definitely got it better at this. Yeah, I'll just say, I wasn't here back then, but, uh... You know, I've seen the growth in the data since over the years that I've been here. And just uh, thank you all for, you know, being part of that contribution, keeping me on my toes. So. And then um, a couple of years after we launched Nature's Notebook, we decided to add animals to Nature's Notebook. Um, and I wanted to show this is a, an example of the data sheet from um, a number of years ago where, you know, it included just a few basic phenophases. But because of mostly the, the contributions of a particular local phenology program called Bird Seasons California, a number of observers in California involved with several Audubon chapters um, that are led by um, uh, Sandy DeSimone at Audubon Star Ranch, we now have a much more <laughs> comprehensive animal protocol. Um, these are both for the same species, Sandhill Crane. Um, so we definitely wanna recognize all of the contributions of that particular group of people to really helping us improve the protocol. And Erin, can I jump in here and add yeah. just that the original set of, for the animal protocols, we decided we want to keep it really simple because we didn't want to overwhelm people um, that, you know, some of these things were too hard to look for. 
But over time, and especially this particular group, we're like, this is too simple. We need something that's more thoroughly captures all the phenology of all these life stages. And so that's just a testament to the, the dedication and the motivation of our observers that want to be far more complete in what they can report. So thank you all. Yeah, and that definitely is a theme that keeps coming up is the observers want to be super rigorous and they're always asking about what else can I do? Um, I want to make sure I get this right. So we definitely appreciate you. So we had um, several different record milestones along the way. Um, so several of us can remember when we first hit um, a million records back in 2012. Um, and from what I remember, we were doing a, a press release at the time and we were super excited to get the word out. And that's when uh, we got the call from the US Geological Survey, which was our, our main funder at the time saying, oh, this is great, but are you guys compliant with the Paperwork Reduction Act? And then we had to make sure that all the data sheets and everything were um, up to the standards there. Uh, in 2017, we hit 10 million records, which we were super excited about. And in just last year, we hit 30 million records. So um, definitely because of all of you who do your uh, nature notebook observations, regularly, um, that is what leads to such a, a great data set that includes so much information. So again, just really appreciate your efforts. And we also added a mobile app, um, which has become more and more frequently used. Um, I think we are, as of last year, we reached the um, milestone that over half of our observers now use the mobile app to submit data, which is very exciting. So. We definitely, we see that and we hear you all that there are improvements that could be made to the app. So that is something that is on our short list of things we are we really wanna do um, in the coming year is really try to dr drill down and see what are the changes we can make to the app to make it more engaging, um, make it less like just a data sheet that's on your phone. Um, so we are you know, working, uh, thinking hard about all those changes that we wanna make and hope to do that soon. Anyone else want to say anything about the app? <laughs> We're always alone. <laughs> All right. Uh, we also launched data collection campaigns. Um, we started out with just a couple campaigns. Some of our early campaigns, such as Green Wave, are still going on. This is our Maples, Oaks, and Poplars campaign. Uh, we now have 10 different campaigns that we're running. So uh, we haven't really retired too many, but um, we, we keep adding to them. There's, um, you know, always researchers and natural resource managers that come to us that are in need of data. And so then we call upon you all, our Nature's Notebook observers, to collect that data to help these people answer their questions. Um, so we have a lot of different campaigns to choose from. On the Nature's Notebook website, you can see which campaigns are located in your area. So you can find out which ones um, you can participate in there. We've also added different kind of incentives for observing. We have a leaderboards page that you can check out on the website. Um, we also have badges that you can earn. All the campaigns have badges. And then we also have um, badges for different milestones like your first observation or your 1000th observation. So if you don't know about those, I encourage you to check them out on your observation deck on the website. Um, another big milestone was the addition of our spring maps, and you might have seen these recently. Um, we've been getting a lot of news coverage about these, but um, we first kind of launched these in 2017. Um, this was taking models that were developed by Mark Schwartz, one of our co-founders, and we really wanted to turn these into something that would be visual, something that people could you know, look at and kind of get an idea of how is spring unfolding in my area. And so we have two maps, the, the spring leaf index and the spring bloom. The leaf index is based on that long-term data set of lilacs that I mentioned earlier. And really what these maps do is they tell you when is that earliest kind of sign of spring happening. So the first plants that generally leaf out in the spring, including lilacs and also honeysuckles um, and many other native species as well. Um, this map will tell you not only when do we predict that is happening in your area, but also how does this year compare to a long-term average to get a sense of whether this spring is earlier or later than that longer term period. So this is the map from this year and you can see that those areas in dark red represent places that are really early. And we're seeing that really across a lot of the, the Southeast here in these dark red colors and this leading edge here is where spring is coming weeks earlier than, than average. 
And in the West, it's been quite a different story. We have um, pretty cold temperatures so far this year. And so we've seen a delayed kind of start to that, that first uh, early season indicator here. And so we've had a lot of fun in the last few years with kind of comparing what we see in our maps for spring versus the, the groundhog predictions for Groundhog Day. So we try to always around Groundhog Day send out our maps and see, you know, kind of what, what's happening and how is spring unfolding compared to those predictions from Punxsutawney Phil and other groundhogs. And uh, we, like I mentioned, we have had lots and lots of interest this year. Um, I think many of us here um, from the staff have fielded different interviews and, and answered questions from reporters. Um, there's just been a really big adoption of this, I think, as an indicator. I think sometimes it can be kind of hard to understand, well, maybe it's been cold or it's been warm, but what does that really mean for plants and animals on the ground? And having this index of spring can give a little bit more of a, a way to understand that. You know, what are the plants actually doing? What are the, the animals that might be waking up? Um, what does that mean for them if it's been really cold or really warm, um, you know, based on the amount of heat that's accumulated? So um, we've seen a lot of interest and I'm sure we'll continue to see it as spring continues to unfold this year. Um, and then another milestone was the addition of what we call our local phenology program. So many of you might participate as what we would call a backyard observer. That would be someone who has a site in their backyard or maybe another nearby location. Um, but we, we understood that many people want to do this as part of a group of individuals. And so we introduced um, local phenology programs, I think about 2017 or so, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, and so I do have a poll that I wanted to launch just to get a sense of um, who is on the call today. So um, you should be able to check more than one, but let us know, are you a nature's notebook observer that participates individually? Are you part of a local phenology program? Are you a local phenology leader? Uh, maybe you're one of our partners, a researcher, or if you're not any of the other ones, um, you're definitely a phenology friend if you're on the call today. So let us know and we'll see kind of the, the breakdown of who we have today. All right, we've got people still reporting. And you can certainly be both. You might have a, you might be part of a local phenology program and then also have a personal site in your backyard, which I think many of us do here on the call. All right, we've got over half have participated, got things rolling in. Okay, I'm going to share. So we have um, almost half or about half our nature's notebook observers, which is great. We have some local phenology program observers. Um, we have a couple local phenology leaders, at least one NPN partner, a couple phenology researchers, and a bunch of phenology friends. So that's wonderful. Thank you all for being here. So um, we really, really love our local phenology programs, and we also love our backyard observers, but we really appreciate our local phenology programs because we really appreciate people that want to come together to kind of answer their own questions that they have about phenology. And so the way that our programs work is often there'll be an organization or, you know, a group of individuals, a community that has something that they want to know about phenology. And so they come together, they decide on what species they're going to track. And then they either, you know, in pairs or in groups or sometimes trading off, will collect data um, trying to answer those questions. And so on the map here, you can see that the gray dots are our personal sites, backyard observer sites, but the little green dots are our local phenology program sites. And since we've started local phenology programs, the number of them has just grown exponentially. We really have a lot of people that have latched onto this idea. So we're really excited to have more and more LPPs every year. And we, we try really hard to give you all the resources that you need. And we're really interested in hearing from you if there's something that you want that we don't have yet. So we're always welcome to, um, or always welcome your feedback. So do let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you meet your goals that you have. This is um, from a survey a couple of years ago, but just kind of a breakdown to show you what kinds of organizations participate in LPPs. Um, so, by far, the most is um, botanical gardens and, and then colleges and universities. That makes up kind of the biggest percentage of the, the types of organizations or groups that participate in, in LPPs. Um, and then we have a lot of different types of organizations as well. 
um, that make up our, our number. I think we have several hundred, um, I think about 250 um, last year that were participating as LPPs. So many, many different organizations um, across the country that are involved in these. And just wanted to pitch that we do have a local phonology leader certification course that Samantha leads. Um, she's in the middle of one right now. This is a really popular course and it really helps you to kind of get an overview of everything that we offer for local phonology programs. It allows you to be part of a cohort of other local phonology leaders. You can bounce ideas off of each other. You get time with Sam to hear from her about her ideas and, and she can give you feedback. Um, and then you're able to kind of work through a whole program planning process. So definitely recommend checking that out if you don't know about it already. Um, you can pass this information along to other people who might be interested as well. Um, and Sam will be running a course again this fall. Um, and also there'll be a self-paced option too, if the kind of short 10 week um, option isn't a good fit for you, there's also that self-paced option. Do you wanna say anything else about that, Samantha? Sure. One thing that I do wanna mention about the course, um, and especially as someone who took the course a few years ago and I didn't even know what phonology was, we just needed a way to be able to monitor um, the pollinators at our pollinator garden and see what was happening there. Um, I just really have enjoyed learning from all of you during the course. So it, it, it is like I'm the instructor. I also learn from all of you, especially when I get such a diversity of leaders from backgrounds all across the United States. So um, it's wonderful seeing everyone interacting and learning from each other and um, helping each other be able to grow and develop really successful programs for um, that can last for many, many years. So um, yes, I invite you, if you're curious about bringing volunteers together or bringing your students together um, to develop a program where you can monitor phonology in your area, um, you can send me an email if you ever have any questions. But yeah, I would encourage you to join and I appreciate all of you who have. Thank you. Another milestone was the addition of our phonology forecast. Um, I think also about 2018, I think was when we first had these. Um, and we launched these with um, five different species. Um, so this one here is an example of a, a forecast for lilac borer. And so basically what we're trying to do with these forecasts is we recognize that there's a lot of need out there for managers to know the best time to treat different invasive species, um, insect pests, and also invasive plants. And there are a number of known what we call thresholds, and you can see an example of one here in that table at the top, where um, usually in cooperative extension, researchers will you know, do experiments and figure out what is the amount of heat that has to accumulate in a particular year before you'll see the emergence of an insect. And that usually is the stage that it's best treated. So for this example with lilac or when there's enough heat that accumulates, the adults will emerge and that's when um, plants can be sprayed with um, pesticide to kill them. And so in order to try to give managers a, a better idea of when that activity will be happening, we translated that, that threshold and we put it into a map format where you can see for any location across the country, um, how close are you to that threshold? So if you were you know, up here in, in Maine, um, you're in the gray area here, there hasn't really been heat that's accumulated. So you're not anywhere close to when that lilac war is gonna be emerging. But if you're down here in the Carolinas, um, you're right at that threshold. You've had enough heat that's accumulated. And so by having maps like this, where you can really see kind of where you're at and how close you are to the threshold, uh, I think it's been really helpful for a lot of managers to be able to know, you know, how much time they have before they need to go out and treat. And in addition to these maps, we've also created a series of notifications. So you can actually sign up for your zip code to get an email two weeks before and then six days before you'll get to that threshold at your location. So we're trying to, you know, use the information that's already out there um, about the phenology of these insects and then put it in a format that's most useful. And we've now um, reached, I think we're up to, is it 14 now, different forecasts that we have available. Um, so we have a number of different insect pests that we um, do forecast for. And then we also have a couple invasive, invasive plants Buffalo grass and red brome. We're also working on a forecast for cheat grass as well with some collaborators at OSU. Um, and then we also have a forecast for winter wheat, which is a little bit of a, an oddball. It doesn't really fit into the invasive category, but wanted to include it here because it is one of our, our pheno forecasts. Um, does anyone else want to say anything about pheno forecasts? 
Oh, maybe just that. Um, I feel like we've taken this opportunity to synthesize weather and climate data in a way that is like biologically relevant, you know, because trying to get the density of data like for a particular species across the country is hard and it takes many years. And so I think we've um, been able to do a little bit more um, in terms of showing patterns of phenology across space and time by um, by leveraging temperature data like we do with these with these you know, forecasts. Yeah. Uh, another milestone was the release of our botany primer. Um, and this is a, a beautiful guide that has lots of photographs and illustrations that is really meant to give you um, a lot of background about botany. Um, it's certainly not necessary to read this in order to use Nature's Notebook and answer the questions, but it does give you kind of a, a more comprehensive understanding of the botany that's kind of behind the questions that um, can maybe help you answer questions for tricky uh, plants that might have something like dormant buds or that have an interesting flower structure. Um, so definitely recommend if you haven't checked this out already, you can download a PDF from the website. Um, and I think there is an option to purchase a hard copy, but it's not great right now. We're still working on other options for that, but you can get the PDF and, and print it yourself if you like. Um, and another shout out to Ellen for this one. Um, Ellen did a ton of work to get this together along with the team. So I don't know if you want to say anything about the, the primer, Ellen. Yeah, I've actually worked more on the Phenify's primer, which is sort of a work in progress um, that is a companion to this. Um, I want to shout out to Patty Guerton, who was the one um, who did the bulk of the work on both of these. Um, she was our botanist and a, a beautiful human being, um, botanist and an artist. And we lost her in 2016, I think it was, to pancreatic cancer. Um, so we're, and we are very happy and her family is actually very happy too to have this sort of as a part of Patty's legacy. Yeah, thank you. Another big milestone for us was the um, release of an updated version of our technology visualization tool. We kind of had different formats for this um, over the years, but the one we have now is a really powerful tool for digging into the phenology data that are available. Um, there's lots of different types of visualizations. And if you go to the Viz tool link, you'll see that there's kind of a, a landing page that has almost like tutorials that are meant to, they're called seasonal stories. They're meant to give you an idea of how to use the tool. It'll give you an example with a, a visualization already made, kind of explain what you're looking at. Um, and then it'll let you know how you can um, adjust the different settings to look at different things. Or if you know exactly what you wanna look for, maybe there's a species of interest, something you've been tracking, you can see what data we have by just going into the data explorer as well. Um, so definitely wanna give a shout out to um, DJ Case on this one, one of the, the contractors that we've worked with. Um, they did a lot of work to put the tool together for us. So we're really appreciative for that. Um, and there's always more and more data being added. Um, there are always improvements that we wanna make and new visualizations to add. So definitely keep checking back on the tool um, to see what else is on there. And you also can download Excel files, um, you know, data, data sets um, if you'd like. So uh, if you are in the visualization tool and looking at different years or species or locations, you can export that to this tool here, or you can go directly to this tool um, and download different um, data sets. We also um, just, was it last year, finalized our observer certification course. This is a, a course that's located on your observation deck. Um, and it's really a, a great way to get a whole orientation to how to use Nature's Notebook. Um, it's also optional, but if you do take it, then you will become a certified observer. And uh, the first module is really the basics on you know, how to set up a site, how to enter data, how to edit data. We also have a module on using the Nature's Notebook app. And then more recently, we've added some more advanced modules that really go through you know, all of the, the phenophases, looking into what is breaking leaf buds, um, what does it look like in different plant groups. Um, and then another one that's really focused on intensity. So helping you to estimate intensity, um, that's the fourth module. And then we have a, a practice session as well. So definitely recommend checking that out. Again, Ellen um, did a ton of work on that um, to get that up last year. So last year we had um, all of the, the modules finalized. And we are working on some other modules too. So on our learning website, um, you'll see there's some other things that are gonna be up on there. 
um, including a, a module that should come out this week that's focused on one of our pest species, emerald ash borer. So we're hoping to expand that learning site and offer some other learning modules. But for now, I definitely recommend checking out the observer certification course. We also, a number of years ago, um, really took a, a deep look at kind of the values that we have here in the National Coordinating Office of the NPN. Um, and I wanted to share, this is going to be on our, our new website, so it's a little screen cap from that, but, um, and this is also located in our um, strategic plan. But these are the, the core values that we've kind of um, wanted to put into words, things that are very meaningful to us as a network. Um, and so definitely wanted to just kind of share out those. We did a, a lot of different discussion sessions. You know, we, we worked a lot together, had a lot of conversations about what really is meaningful to us. What do we want to kind of set in stone as the things that are the, the central part of what we do. And so these are our, our core values. And while we were doing that, we also realized that um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is very meaningful for us here among our staff. Um, and so at the time, this is a couple of years ago, we had, you know, three different what we called pillars of the network, informing decisions, advancing science and communicating, connecting. And we added the fourth pillar of creating an equitable and inclusive network, kind of stemming from those values and recognizing that we want to ensure that the work that we do here at the network is really um, useful and meaningful and um, encompasses everyone that lives in the country. So. We want to make sure that we are meeting the needs of everyone, um, including underserved populations. And so we wanted to, to put that out there as a, a really a fourth pillar that we have here at the network. Also, we had some um, TV appearances over the years. Um, we were featured on Psy Girls, um, as well as uh, The Crowd in the Cloud, a, a series that was on PBS, I think. Um, as well as American Spring Live, which was a, a couple years ago, a, a series that was also on PBS um, that really looked into, you know, what is spring and following spring across the country. Um, we had some some people film down um, just south of Tucson, including some nature's notebook observers locally here um, to kind of look at a, a lilac that happens to be down there at an experimental station that's part of the U of A. Um, so we've had some some fun being on, on TV over the years and having nature's notebook featured. Um, and we're always happy to get the word out to more people that way. We've also um, won a number of awards over the years, thanks in a large part to your efforts and all the work that you've done as Nature Notebook Observers. Um, and there's really been a recognition across, you know, different federal agencies, all the way up to the Department of the Interior, that what we're doing is really important. You know, the data that you all are collecting are really valuable. And they're really making a difference for helping researchers understand changes that are happening. So just looking a little bit more about at the data here. Um, so you can see the graph here on the left is a, a kind of a chart that shows the amount of data that's accumulated in different years since we started. Um, it's a little hard to read because there's so many years now of data. Um, but you can see that generally we've increased each year the amount of data that's come in to Nature's Notebook. Um, and this most recent year, 2023 here, we're, we're pretty much on track here um, to have at least as much data coming in this year as previous years. So really appreciate all of you that continue to observe year after year um, and, and contribute to this data set. And the data have been used in many different ways. Um, one is researchers will use the data in peer reviewed publications. Uh, we also have natural resource managers using the data. Um, and the data, especially the, the spring maps that we put out there have also been used in different documents, um, reports like the, the National Climate Assessment and the EPA Indicators Report as well. And so uh, there have been a lot of publications. I can't remember when we crossed the 100th publication milestone, but um, there are, have been a lot of different research studies that have used the data that you collect. And I think we're up to 130 right now. Um, and we're just getting started for this year. So I just wanted to share kind of an overview of the ways that people have used your data. Um, we kind of split it into two different types. Um, one is management applications. So we have uh, active research that's ongoing to help people select species for restoration, including um, pollinator restoration. Also um, trying to time different management actions like uh, the work on pest species, invasive 
plants, trying to understand, you know, what is the best time to get out there and remove a plant before it goes to seed um, or, you know, spray a plant with herbicide at the right time when it's green enough that that plant will uptake the herbicide. Um, also risk assessment, we had a paper a couple years ago looking at wildfire risk linked to the phenological stage in California, and that was um, looking at chemis. And so when that plant is at a stage where it's, it's past flowering and the flowers are drying out, that represents the, the time when it's, it's most flammable. So, you know, having that indicator really allows people to just kind of survey the landscape and really easily identify the time when that wildfire risk is, is most severe. Um, and then also tracking synchrony among species. And I wanted to show this example from our, our friends up at McDowell Sonoran up in Phoenix. Um, they have been for a number of years now looking at the, um, the phenology of both saguaro flowering as well as white-winged dove, one of our migrating birds here. Um, and this I thought was a really interesting year. Last year we had a, a pretty low amount of saguaro flowers. And so you can kind of see that reflected on this graph where they actually observed the white-winged doves arriving even prior to when the saguaros had open flowers. And typically you would see that reverse where the, the doves are kind of following the saguaro bloom as they, they go north. And so the kind of work that this group is doing, um, this local phenology program to document this is really important to help us understand when there might be a mismatch or you know, when that overlap isn't as, as much as it should be. Um, so by having that data, we're able to see when that's happening and, and then They'll keep tracking that and see if this is kind of a fluke that happened last year or if that's something that we're seeing more and more often. Um, and then on the science application side, um, this is probably where we have even more publications that have come out using our data. Um, we've had people look at just kind of fundamental ecological discoveries, things like um, how does the phenology of mistletoe line up to the host plant phenology on different trees here in the Southwest. Um, a lot of papers that have looked at the changes that have happened over time in phenology and also looking at projections, you know, if we know that there's a, a link in between a particular flowering time of a plant and the temperature that precedes that, then we can look at well, what is that going to be like in 20 years when the temperature is higher? Um, is that flowering timing going to be earlier? And so there's been a lot of papers also that have tried to find those links. Um, there's a lot of work done by people like um, Susan Mazur in California looking at the long-term data set they have there, trying to find those linkages. Is it temperature, is it precipitation? What causes things to leaf out, flower and fruit? Um, and then can we use that to understand what that's gonna be like under future climate conditions? Um, and then relationships across gradients as well. And I wanted to share an example from one of our campaigns that's now ended that we ran a number of years ago called Shady Invaders, um, working with Aaron Maynard Bean at Penn State and so we, we had Nature's Notebook observers collect data on invasive and native shrubs in the eastern part of the country. Um, and you can see on the map here, we had several people observe for all three years or, or two years, and some of them just one. But they were able to record information about when these invasive shrubs leaf out and then when the native shrubs leaf out to see if we can pick up on that kind of competitive advantage that we, we predict that invasive species have. Um, being able to take advantage of that earlier temperature and leaf out sooner. Um, and she found that indeed, especially at Southern latitudes, there is a big difference in when those invasive shrubs are able to leaf out versus the natives. And they have a jump start of on the order of a couple months earlier. And so that really gives them the ability to leaf out and kind of outcompete those native shrubs and also shield other little plants on the forest floor that really depend on that sunlight. Um, they really were missing out because those invasive species leafed out soon. And that relationship was um, less of a, a difference here at the northern latitude. So a really interesting finding there as well. So if you want to read more about these kind of, of studies that have used your data, um, hopefully you know that we, we do publication summaries. Um, every other month, we, we pick one that has used Nature's Notebook data, uh, and we do a, a short summary on it to help you kind of digest the, the research in the peer-reviewed publication. We give you a summary of what they found, um, kind of tell you why it's significant and why you should care about it. Um, so you can see those on our website. We also put those out in our newsletter. So we'll have a, a newsletter QR code at the end where you can sign up for our newsletters, um, but definitely sign up for those so you can learn about the, the research findings using your data. And also, um, if you want even more of the data results, um, on Wednesday, we're going to be releasing a, a pre-recorded video from our director, Teresa Crimmins, who's going to share about three different papers from the last few months that have used her data. 
So definitely check back um, or sign up for our Phenology Week emails and you'll get the video recording for that. Um, and then we've also, in the last couple of years, been doing twice a year these um, kind of Nature's Notebook data uses webinars. So you can watch the videos of those if you want to hear more about studies in the last couple of years that have used your data. And then I also welcome you to, um, as I mentioned before, go to the Vistool and check out the data. Um, I also wanted to draw your attention to this really cool tool that we have where you can put in your zip code and see the amount of heat that's accumulated in your area. Um, and this can be really interesting, I think, to do because sometimes you know our memories aren't um, super reliable and you might think, oh, it's been so cold this year. It's just like, it's crazy that it's been so much colder than usual. And then you go into this tool and you might see that oh, it's a lot colder than last year, but compared to average, it's really not that cold. So this will give you kind of the, the data look at um, the temperatures that have accumulated in your area. And then you can you know, look at all these different tutorials, um, also go to the data explorer to explore data of interest to you. Um, just wanted to briefly mention too, because there have been lots of research publications using your data, but we have some other kind of more fun or <laughs> interesting uses of the data as well. Um, so we've had several people reach out to us um, with the, the purpose of knowing when have trees leafed out in a particular area. Um, one example was someone from a, a New York State municipality who was looking for people who were doing illegal building activities. And he wanted to know, um, well, when is the latest I could start looking at these aerial images so I can make sure that the trees aren't going to be covering up that building activity. So then I can make sure that I can audit people who are doing building without a permit. Um, and then we've also had other people that have reached out about kind of similarly looking at, you know, when are the trees going to be leafed out so I can make sure that I can do my surveys before that um, for purposes of doing, you know, like aerial photography, um, also work on cell towers. So they wanted to know, you know, how long do I have until the canopy closes to do my work that I need to. We've also had authors reach out about the timing of different events. Um, one author in particular wanted to know when magnolias are going to be flowering so he can make sure to be accurate in his book. Um, and then we had um, someone reach out from a show on HBO Max, The Sex Lives of College Girls, a show by Mindy Kaling. Um, and they wanted to know about um, when to expect different phenology of trees happening at different college campuses so they could make sure that they're um, being accurate and kind of like showing, you know, um, taping at a particular time of year um, to make sure that it's lining up with when things were happening in the show. So some, some fun different examples there. I don't know if anyone else has any other examples that they remember, but feel free to chime in if you know about other ones. And then I also wanted to draw attention to some of the really untapped potential in our data set, um, your data set really. So uh, definitely wanted to mention that we have a number of observers that are recording data on birds as well as other animals. But really, I don't think we've had any research publications yet that have used the data on, on birds that we have in Nature's Notebook. And we have especially our, our partners in Audubon, California, that have been collecting data for eight years now at some locations. They have a really great data set. And we hope that a researcher will come along that wants to use that data. Um, so definitely want to try to get the word out that we have the data available. Um, we also have a lot of data on fruiting. And there's really been you know, only a few publications that have looked at that so far. But there's a lot of potential there for understanding um, food abundance for wildlife. And so we want to uh, make sure people know about those great data as well. And then our intensity data as well, I think a lot of people don't know about those, but I know a lot of you diligently um, indicate, you know, the percent canopy cover, the number of flower buds, all that stuff. So um, we're hoping that some researcher will be interested in that and really um, tap into that potential. And we're also doing some work here in the National Coordinating Office to try to make kind of an indicator of peak phenology. So we're hoping that we'll be able to get that out there into the, the summarized data and the visualization tool as well. And so what's next? So we, uh, we mentioned that we're working on a new website. Um, and if you come to our webinar on Friday, we're going to have a sneak peek of that website. So we'll be actually um, doing a live demo. We'll show you some of the new features. Um, some of them are really exciting, especially for local phonology programs. So if you haven't signed up for our Friday webinar, definitely do that. Um, also some unknown updates to the Nature's Notebook app. Um, we'll be really digging into that this year and figuring out what we wanna do to make that better and more engaging. We're also doing a lot of um, data analysis work this year, trying to 
or data analysis guidance this year, trying to help our local phenology programs better understand their data and be able to have a series of learning modules to support them in doing that. Um, and then Ellen, I don't know if you want to say anything about the phenophase primer or phenobase, because those are in, in your court. <laughs> Yeah, as I mentioned uh, previously, the Phenophos Primer is, um, we envision it to have three sections. One of us, th them is done, and Patty, as I'd mentioned, um, did a lot for section two. I haven't been able to get back to it, but I'm hoping to do that this year to have one and two done. And then section three is intensity, and hopefully that will follow and we'll get that done soon as well. Phenobase is another um, project that I'm involved with, and it is, um, designed to harmonize phenology data collected around the world from different methods. And we have um, Helfried and uh, Marcus on the call here, I see from Austria, they are involved with the Pan-European Phenology Network. And mm, probably seven or eight years ago, um, we started this project and we created an ontology, a controlled vocabulary to be able to look at our two data sets, which were um, collected with different methods and kind of seam them together and put them in an online, a portal. So somebody can go and get data from different places in the world all in one place. That has been recently, the second round of funding has come through and we are now working on expanding that to other um, ground observations around the world, different networks like the US Phenology Network in other countries, as well as um, data that comes from <clears throat> scoring, um, herbarium specimens, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as crowdsourced images like iNaturalist. So um, that'll be going on the next three years and keep an eye out. Yeah, awesome. It's a really cool project. We're really excited to see what comes out of that. All right, so um, I'm gonna pass it to Samantha. She's gonna give you kind of a, a preview of what's next for the rest of the week. There you go, there's the unmute button. Yeah, thank you, Erin. Um, so we have a lot of events planned this week. Um, if you go to our website um, for uh, Phenology Week, I'm gonna put that in right here. Um, you can, if you haven't done so already, you can sign up to get daily emails for events occurring every day this week. Um, tomorrow, we have our researcher Q&A webinar where you'll actually get a chance to um, learn from some of the researchers who are using your data and be able to ask them questions. Um, on Tuesday, if you're here in Tucson, um, we'll be meeting up at the Critch Garden to do some watercolor painting and make some observations and actually get to like meet each other in person um, and talk about phenology and some of the things that we've noticed in the past few years. On Wednesday, we have that video of Teresa's plant side chat that will be sent out to everybody. Um, and then Thursday, we'll release our annual report local technology program annual survey, um, and also we'll announce our 2022 Fino champions. And then at Friday, we'll have our grad, grad gratitude party, excuse me, awards, um, and just kind of like get together and just celebrate um, everything we've accomplished this week. Also as a part of those like kind of daily um, emails, and you'll see these on social media as well, but we'll have um, daily phenology week challenges. So today's phenology challenge was that is that we're encouraging people to go out and find a plant that you may walk by every day and you just don't really know it that well. It's a part of your everyday life and you don't see it or you don't, maybe you haven't taken the time to notice it or really thought about um, the plants that we see around us every day. So um, find a plant that you haven't really spent any time with and go spend some time with it. Um, learn about what it's called, where is it native, maybe something unique about the plant, take a picture of it and share it on social media with the hashtag Phenology Week. And we'll be sharing all of those um, kind of participations on Friday as well. Awesome, thank you. So um, I mentioned we have a, a newsletter sign up here. So hopefully if you're on your computer, you can hold your phone up and, and scan this QR code. Um, and we have three different newsletters. So one is um, our narrative, which is our, our observer newsletter. We have a, a newsletter for partners in local phenology programs called The Connection and then Leaflet, which is our, our researcher newsletter. So you can sign up for all or any of those that you like. Um, also, I definitely recommend um, checking out the campaigns page if you want more emails from us because we'll send out information about um, campaign species, results and things like that. So it's a good way to kind of 
hear from us about how your data are being used, the results from different campaigns. Um, so definitely check those out. I don't know if we've had any any questions come in or anything like that, but if anyone has questions for us, I know we're at the top of the hour, but um, we can hang on for a few minutes. Um, some people might have to jump off for other calls, but um, we welcome any questions that you have for us. Um, and just thank you again for all of your efforts and, and we're so glad that you could join us today. And I also open it up if there's anything that anyone else on the staff wants to add. Um, any missed milestones or other things you're excited about that we're working on next? I know we have a lot going on and I definitely just put a couple things on that. What's next for Nature Silva? Because there's a lot. <laughs> Don't see any questions coming in. Any last words from anyone? We did have a question come in if the other web meetings use the same login for this one. I do believe that they're um, separate registrations, correct? They are, yeah. All right, well, if there's no other questions, thank you all so much for being here. Um, thanks again to all of our lovely staff for coming on and sharing a little bit about your, your roles and background and things like that. And hopefully we will see you on another webinar tomorrow or later this week. Um, and we will be sending you emails, hopefully if you signed up for those to um, update you about other Phenology Week happening. So thanks again for joining us and have a good week. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you.